Hello, this is a short presentation on the BAS model. There's an illustration here of using the BAS model um, and the parameters that you would have for the BAS model, how we would get those for a digital camera. And uh, it also walks through uh, the example, the illustration walks through the process of using the BAS model in Excel to be able to forecast sales for a product um, over a long period of time. And then it also illustrates how adjustments to the model can be made um, given actual data um, for a particular industry and um, and how the forecast itself and the parameters can help us make marketing decisions um, to improve sales and um, gain a competitive advantage. In this BAS model example, what we want to do is examine a particular product and try to predict sales for that product in a uh, in the future so this would be a forecast of particular sales and what we're going to do is imagine that we have developed the technology for our company for a digital camera so this is going to be in the early 1990s or perhaps late 1980s but the 1990s is really when digital technologies started to be implemented in a lot of the um, products that we that, that we had used so up to this particular point in time people would use a traditional camera which would involve film and so um, you know to use a camera you go to the store you buy film uh, you take your pictures uh, by frame and then each frame or the film um, itself has to be processed so um, this takes a certain amount of time. You can't have your photos right away. You can't look at them right away. Um, you have to, uh, in fact, you take your picture and then you send the, the film off, typically paying, paying some money, and then it comes back a couple days later and then you get to see the picture that you actually took. So that's, that's pretty much the technology of analog film, um, film cameras. And so uh, to be able to adopt a digital technology for cameras uh, the consumer has to understand or has to be able to be um, comfortable with the technology of digital photos and this idea that the photo is actually a, a, a computer file as opposed to something that you can you can handle um, it um, the, the technology of the time in the 1990s um, happened to be very very limited in the sense that uh, picture quality was a big big issue because um, photos were pretty large sized files and um, being able to compress such a file it was actually technologically pretty difficult so um, you had to deal with this idea that you could take a digital photo but the digital photo would take up a certain amount of memory and and most of the time uh, we really didn't have um, uh, storage devices like memory sticks or things like that that would hold a lot of memory so the number of photos that you could have uh, really was dependent on how much um, size each photo each photo um, took up and that was really a function of quality um, so the better quality photos the more pixels that were um, in in a photo the more uh, memory would be stored which is of course true today but the difference back then is memory and storage was super expensive compared to today and um, very difficult to handle. So, uh, so there were definitely some reasons why people would not necessarily want to adopt um, a digital technology like this. Um, even though um, there are some clear advantages in costs and time savings and so forth. Another issue is that um, people had to get used to a photo being sort of this invisible digital thing, whereas um, that you viewed on a TV screen or a, a television monitor or something along those lines, as opposed to something that you necessarily held. And if you wanted to print the photo out, 
again, you're dealing with quality issues because the quality of the photo is only going to be as good as the quality of the printer that it's being printed on. So the whole host of technological issues that people had to address and overcome in order to adopt this particular this particular new product. So moving forward, we've developed a technology to be able to create this, this camera. We did some market testing. And so after our market tests, our concept tests, we realized or we measured um, the amount of people or percentage of, of the market that would buy the product right away, that would definitely buy the product. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use that number, the percentage of the market off of the concept test as our estimate for P, the external influence of our model. So. 0 0.02 will be what we use um, and that's actually something that is common if we do a concept test we'll look at the number or percentage of people who check the very top box the people who will definitely buy the product and we'll often use that as our um, as our rate of internal influence it'll also be considered the people who are our lead users or the innovators. So the innovator number on the product lifecycle chart, the, the number or percentage of innovators is usually around two to 5% roughly of our total market size. And we can use that top box of the concept test to estimate and actually identify too who our innovators are and who the lead users are. And so we'll use that for P here. Uh, moving forward, we need to be able to have some type of estimate or starting point for Q. Remember, Q is the measure of internal influence. So what we'll do is we'll take a look at some other products that have um, been launched in the past, and we'll look at their sales data. And um, using, using some uh, maximum likelihood estimation, what we'll do is we'll come up with an estimate for what Q has been in the past for other digital products. So for instance, we could look at DVD sales. We could look at the launch and sales for digital clocks or digital phones. Um, so cell phones emerged in the 1980s and, and continued through the 1990s. Um, what we can do is we can look at sales from other products that we think would be similar in terms of how they are diffused to our current product, the, um, the, the digital camera. So we're going to take that data and we're going to say that 0.7 is a reasonable starting point or estimate for Q given other products that have similarly been launched um, moving forward. The last step is to estimate M, which would be market potential. So we need three parameters for the BAS model, um, P, Q, and M. All three of these are, are in this particular form static, so they stay the same throughout the entire model, but we need to be able to estimate those. So M is probably um, one of the easier things to estimate, um, though, again, it's a forecast or an estimation, so there's going to be some error in it. What we're going to do is say that the digital camera market potential is going to be 500 million units. Um, so, so 500 million units actually will be the buying potential for this for this particular market. So we're actually we're not going to use that shouldn't be there. We're going to say 500 million units, and um, we get this from market research. We get this by estimating our market size. Um, now, for this example, um, we are using this figure as an industry total. So this is so this is again one of the things about the mass model and some of these econometric models they're really positioned or focused on an industry not necessarily my company's sales but the industry sales also the the way they typically work is to think of the total market size over time so we might be talking about a product that is launched and then in use for 20 or 30 years and if you think like well 20 or 30 years from now i mean how many total units will we sell as an industry so this number is a big number clearly but it's 
you know it's intended to be uh, because it's an industry number and it's a long-term long-term type of a number okay so moving forward um, when we think about the bass model itself you've seen this model before um, where we have sales um, at a given time and we have our different parameters thrown in there as well as um, as well as cumulative sales up to a specific point in time T. So um, S sub T is the adopters during a specific or discrete time period. So one specific time period at a time, uh, year one, year two, year three, year four, and so on and so forth as far as the model goes. Um, P, we know, is the coefficient of external influence. So um, this is that, you know, that that number that we had from our concept test, 0 0.02, so 2 percent. 0.7 is what we're going to use for the coefficient of internal influence. Um, we're going to use 500. So this is in thousands. So this is in thousands. That's why it's 500 thousand so that would actually represent our, our 500 million if we added those zeros in there um, the data that I have for this example use we have actual data that's supplied by the camera and imaging um, industry association so um, their data that they've provided us actually is in thousands so when we finish this example um, we'll actually look at actual data so their data is reported to us in thousands so that's why i've placed this in thousands here just so that our unit levels are consistent across um, the example and, and and the actual data and then finally we have our cumulative adopters um, which would be y sub t that is a that's a variable right that's a variable the other elements here so s sub t is a variable y sub t is a variable pqm are parameters parameters don't change variables do um, but so this is this is the way the model will be set up and this will be the information that we plug into the model in this example and to illustrate exactly how this fits in here um, then we'll actually substitute we have s sub t then we have our p we have our total market potential, then we have Q, then P, um, Y sub T, and then we have Q divided by our market potential, and then Y sub T again. So we're just plugging in our parameters here, and then we're going to actually find our uh, variables through, um, through some data work. Okay, so... Um, all right, so now uh, what we'll do is we'll take this model and take these numbers and we're gonna move over to Excel. We're gonna build the model in Excel and then we're gonna go through time and we're gonna see how uh, we do from a model perspective. Okay, um, this example is now um, here in Excel. And uh, again, this is the 1990 estimated parameter um, model that we have talked about. We have P, uh, which is 0 0.02 from our concept test. We have Q, which is 0.7. That's the estimated degree to which people will share information together. So the word of mouth or a person to person influence um, internally within the model. And then we have our market potential size of 500 million units. It's 500,000 here, but we're thinking about this in thousands. Um, the, the thing um, about this is my actual data that I have from the industry is in thousands. So I want to be able to have um, my units um, correspond with each other. Um, and then we have down below here our actual model that we have uh, figured out. And again, it's in Excel. So this column is our time or our T, our time period T. So 94 through 2016 is our time period. Y sub T, as you, as you know or recall, Y uh, sub T is the cumulative number of sales prior to time T. So we have, for instance, in 1995, we have 1,000 units of sales. Um, here we had estimated um, in 94 that we would have 1,000 units sold. 
and so this is the this is the estimate moving forward. Um, you'll see that this gradually grows larger and larger and larger. Again, this is cumulative sales over time. And so um, it reaches a total of 500,000, which is our total market potential in this particular example. Um, so that seems to make sense that cumulative sales would increase every single year until the uh, market is saturated. Um, so that makes perfect sense there. Uh, moving forward, uh, we have in this column S sub T, and this is really where the magic of the model happens. S sub T is what we're trying to find, which is our sales in a specific given time period. So for instance, if I looked at say 1999 and I looked at S sub T, this model estimates that 82,687 units will be sold in that time period, in that year, that specified, that forecasted year. And again, remember these are in thousands, so what we're really talking is 82,687,000 units. And that's worldwide by the industry. But this is S sub T. This is, this is specifically sales within a specific time period. And if we look at this S sub T and we go up to the formula bar, so we're looking now at the formula for S sub T. This, um, this is the same formula every single time period. This is the BAS model formula. This is the model, that, this is the formula you just saw um, in, the, in the PowerPoint example. Now we're just applying it in Excel with real numbers. So we have P, which is this, this blue 0 0.02 times the market potential. So it's this reddish color here. Um, plus uh, we have Q then um, minus uh, P, so Q minus P, 7.7 .7 minus 0 0.02 times Y sub T. So this B14 is this green area. This is the, this is the Y sub T that we have minus uh, Q divided by uh, market potential again multiplied by y sub t raised to the second power. So this is the BAS model, um, just specified now as opposed to um, in written out form. This is in um, a specified form where we're actually measuring the model as, as we move forward. Um, so um, when we calculate sales in time period one, we estimate there to be 10,000 units of sales. Um, in our thousands and then it, it kind of goes up for a while and then it goes down for a while which makes sense because that's the sales the sales curve the product life cycle curve that's what we would expect to happen so the bass model actually it's actually a hazard model and um, what happens is over time the the, the effects of um, external influence um, of this P actually diminish overall and the effects of Q increase as time progresses. So it's a hazard model um, and, and that's kind of the results. Now, what we've done here is it gone ahead and included um, in the same chart actual sales. Now, we wouldn't normally have this, but we're looking in hindsight. We're looking at data that's already been uh, happened. And so um, we're going we're gonna to take actual data from, from the industry and compare it to our estimate. So over here, we take a look at this chart and we're like, whoa, there's something going on here. Something's wrong. Our blue line is our estimate and the orangey line here is the actual sales for um, digital cameras over, over time. So this is this is a challenge. Now here's the thing: um, estimates are are sometimes difficult. These are industry wide, so we're talking about really really big numbers, and we're projecting you know 10, 20, 30 years into the future. So it's kind of like having a crystal ball and trying to predict the future a little bit. Um, we are clearly wrong in some of our estimations. Um, so um, what we'll want to do is um, try to determine what's going on, why this is happening, and what we can do to improve our forecast.
Um, what we can do is we can take several different estimates at once and so we could have a range of estimates so a high and a low or high medium and low type of an estimate um, we can um, we can we can rethink our P's and our Q's but again in you know real time we don't know that this is going to be the case now the reality is digital cameras um, took a long time to take off, um, as do a lot of new, radical, uh, new-to-the-world types of products. Remember, uh, memory, uh, digital memory, uh, was really, really expensive back in the early 90s, and it was really, really limited. And so picture quality for cameras uh, was really, really um, uh, hampered by the effects of not having a lot of memory capacity and um, the fact that the better quality picture would require more memory to be stored on a digital file, plus the whole transition from analog and physical to digital and some type of a photo that's, you know, on a computer screen that I can't really hold um, really, really slowed down the adoption of this particular technology. Now, I want to move forward a little bit because um, one of the things that we can do is um, we can estimate P, Q, and M in a different way if we have a little bit of sales data. Now, again, this is... Um, uh, not always realistic because, you know, if we're launching a product or we're doing concept testing, we're not going to have sales data. Um, but let's just say we had some sales data. Um, if we have four to five time periods of sales data, so like if we, if we already had some of this data here in advance, um, then what we can do is take this data and extrapolate from this data using maximum likelihood estimation, we can build a model that predicts P, Q, and M based on just a few time periods of actual data. Okay, so down below here, um, in this next little bit of information, I've done some of this, where I've taken this information here, and I have estimated using maximum likelihood estimation. I've, I've, and this can be done in SPSS, it can be done in SAS, it can be done in a, you know, a statistical software program, we could probably even do it in Excel. Um, but we can take this data, and the more periods of time, the better. Um, but you can take four or five or six years of data, oops, um, and we can use that information to recalibrate and, and re-estimate P, Q, and M. So I've done that. Now, what happens is the P figure and the Q figure both go down quite a bit. Okay, they both go down quite a bit. And as a result, um, we have this model um, that, um, that was figured up here. Um, and actually, I, I changed it from a little while ago. So um, the numbers that I had earlier uh, looked something like this um, and th this was the num these were the numbers that came back um, and were re returned from the MLE estimation and so 0 0.002 is a better more accurate fit for um, this particular model um, point for, for P 0.55 is a better fit for Q and um, then we had a much higher, um, a much higher ma um, market potential as well, which we kind of suspected from the information we had above. And if we put these numbers in, and then we we go ahead and let our BAS model do its work, we see a much much closer um, combination here between actual and um, estimated. Um, estimated sales for the BAS model. Okay, so this wraps up the um, BAS model example, but it also illustrates how we can change our um, P and Q and M a little bit using um, some advanced um, uh, estimation model modeling for, through MLE, and um, we can actually get a much better fit for a model if we have some data that's already already there.